Oki, get connect some at Simpoa, Nisto Anagok, not to Inski. Nymph to to Gana Sakoi. Nymph set the beaks a gay book ax. A nin anesta up a knuckle stomach, Nixes anesta Achiop Sapiaki. Um, na sex anestaya Agena Makoyaki. Carl Zitlow, Madge Michaels. So my name is Katira Kroshu. I'm from Kainai. I'm from the Mini Children's Clan. Uh, my parents are Alvin and Tamara Mini Chief, and my grandparents are Ray and Adeline Mini Chief, and Carl Zitlow and Madge Michaels. So I thank you all for coming to see my presentation, Is It to Be Trauma? So pre-colonization, there was a concept of trauma for us Nisitibiks people. This might have looked like warfare with the enemy tribe where injury or death occurred. It might have also looked like somebody unexpectedly dying from sickness, accidentally or tragically dying while hunting or gathering. So before colonization, Nisitibiks, we had our own practices when it came to health issues such as trauma. But the trauma that was created as a result of colonization it has impacted Nisita Beaks and their health historically, intergenerationally, and collectively. So historical trauma, so Braveheart defines historical trauma as cumulative, emotional, and psychological wounding across generations, including the lifespan, which emanates from a massive group trauma. So Walters provides key components of historical trauma and this is an event or set of events that are perpetrated on a group of people, including their environment, who share a specific group identity. Example, nationality, tribal affiliation, ethnicity, religious affiliation, with genocidal intent. Example, annihilation, disruption to traditional lifeways, culture, and identity. So example of this would be the mass killings of the buffalo. It'd be the forced removal of children into residential schools. Not only that, we had intergenerational trauma. So Burstow defines intergenerational or transgenerational trauma as the psychological effects of systemic oppression being passed down from one generation to the next generation. So intergenerational trauma would be more specific to the individuals who went to residential school and what was passed on to subsequent generations. So we hear the loss of culture, the loss of language, but sometimes within lineages, there's specific specificities. Um, for example, it might mean um, the way disciplining is done amongst the family is kind of passed down. It might mean there is a lack of emotional, like there's emotional disconnect. It might mean there's actual physical disconnect. And sometimes those are exact to certain lineages. Um, there's spiritual disconnection, and this is a result of our ancestors being placed in residential school. And then we have collective trauma. So both historical and intergenerational or transgenerational trauma is collective trauma to many Nisitabiks. Since Nisitabiks have simultaneously experienced since colonial migration histories of genocide, colonization, forced assimilation, and exclusion that undermine intergenerational health and well-being. So an example of this is all indigenous peoples in North America, we've all had similar colonial experiences. So as multiple nations, we have all um, experienced collective trauma. And so the three of these actually lead to cultural trauma. So as a result of historical, intergenerational, transgenerational, and collective trauma, Nisitibiks have been disconnected from our Nisitibi values, our stories, our songs, traditions, and customs. So an example would be um, stories of the land. Um, I once heard somebody from Bigani told me that um, sometimes there are certain areas on Bigani that there's like a spirit attached to that area. And so I'm like, oh, like that is so interesting. No longer do we hear, um, well, I haven't heard, and maybe I do hope that there still is, people who sing lullabies for children. Um, something that I've been guilty of is not making my guests something to eat and drink when they come to visit. That was a custom, that was a tradition. I always remember growing up, my dad, like even the water guy coming, ah, oh, you come in to eat, right? And 
like, you know, he had to sit there and eat. And <laughs> he was very courteous and kind. Um, cultural trauma, like our wise warnings. I still tell my children, you don't cry at night. You don't look out at nighttime. Um, you don't whistle at night. I still tell them, um, the sun's going down. You need to come in. Don't play outside. Well, why? And then I tell them the story behind that. I'm like, well, you know, you know what happened to your grandpa Alvin? I'm like, so then, you know, and I worked at an elementary school and I was amazed at how many of the kids were just outside at nighttime, just wandering around and how much of those like wise warnings and you could even talk to them as like natural laws because it was something that you just did not do. It was like taboo. Um, and so it's like us, that's kind of been lost through this. Um, so, and not only that, Nisitipi land has experienced trauma with the near extinction of the buffalo. But not only that, what, like the oil that's being extracted from it, we think of all the minerals, right? The mines, the multiple mines that are around. Um, you know, and then I've heard about the fires also, like that could be seen as trauma. It could also be seen as, you know, the earth regenerating itself too, depending on how you look at it, right? Um, and so colonial Western way of viewing trauma. And so trauma has been viewed and labeled as a disease or illness. So the colonial way labels individuals, families, and communities as in having an incurable pathology that we're destined to carry out through our lives. You know, one of the things, um, I think about this as the end of the trail and how that is used. And it's just like this crumpled Indian on the horse, right? And to me, I think, well, that might be what they wanted us to end up, but we, we're not, we're still here, right? So it takes away people's power, it perpetuates shame, it creates isolation and secrecy. Sometimes I think about um, like what I experienced as a child and again, that shame and secrecy and not sharing what I was experiencing. But had I shared, I probably would have come to know, oh, my friend's experiencing that. Oh, someone else experienced that, right? And to start, oh, okay, it's not just a individualistic thing, it's kind of collective. Um, and so colonial perspective, it does not honor the individual's tr trauma wisdom. So wounding and loss, this is an indigenous way of looking at trauma. So indigenous scholars and practitioners use the words soul wound or soul loss instead of trauma. So Vickers and Moyer suggest that when an individual experiences traumatic event or situation, a piece of the spirit breaks away and now belongs to the space and time where the trauma occurred. So healing, would now involve the process of retrieving part of the soul or spirit that's been held, by the cap held captive by the traumatic event. And I was thinking about this and I thought, okay, part of our spirit. And then I thought of elders. When you travel, call your spirit back. You know, you think, it, it, and it's not even for, um, it's also when you're doing good things, camping at a gukatsin, call your spirit back. You leave tobacco, you call your spirit back, right? And so I started making that connection. Okay, so this kind of makes that like a, I do agree with this. So if we think from our Nisitipi perspective that everything is relational, so when trauma impacts an individual, the trauma makes a relationship with either or all the mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional parts of the individual. I wanted to talk about a bit about the uh, speaker that we had. He talked about like the mice and how they had been, you know, passed on the trauma and how they were born with trauma. Um, so one of the things that I have kind of talked about is just how it might be on the next slide. Oh no, okay. So I have come to the realization that because of historical trauma, because of collective trauma and intergenerational trauma, that we are already born with complex trauma. And it's dependent on our environment, similar to what, like the epigenetics. It's similar to what's going on in our environment, to what kind of like, I guess, comes out in our genes, right? 
Um, and so when he talked about that, and I just really thought about like how each of us is born with blood memory of trauma from, um, again, it's that collective trauma, how we've all experienced some type of oppression, right? It's intergenerational, how we've, things have been passed down specifically in our families. And then it's that collective that as Indigenous people of Canada, we've all experienced this. So wouldn't that be called genetic memory? Yeah, I call it blood memory. I mean, yeah, it could be genetic memory. And it's just like how when we always say, well, you know. Yeah. And we actually know. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's like when you hear somebody speak and you just know it's true. Like you just you just know, right? Like how you're saying. Genetic you're just memory. like, yeah. It's like your something in your blood memory is like, yeah. That is the way it is, right? Like <laughs> It's the best way to explain it, but you all know I'm just <laughs> So like our Nisitipi wellness, um, and I, like I know I said Nisitipi trauma, and that's where like I think about how, um, again, that negative pathology and it, how it gets labeled in our communities and with our people, but how we kind of need to start um, looking at ways that we can combat that. So I also included like Nisitipi wellness. And so when we talk about our Nisitipi ontology, our epistemology, our axiology, our ontology is understanding that everyone is connected in everything. You think about on our reserves, when we hear about something kind of happening to somebody in our community, we feel it, right? You think about somebody when our, when there's deaths in the community, you're like, oh, like you feel it, right? Because we're all connected. Our epistemology is knowing that human beings are interconnected with the natural order through the spiritual forces coming from Isibatibio. So Nisitipi knowledge is lived collectively and holistically by the people. So it is our goal in, and more so this is like pre-colonization, but we were collectively well and holistically because we were all together all the time. So our axiology, it involves our values and how strongly we believe in them and how valuable they are to us. So these are Nisitipi values. Atimoikan, our spirituality. Espomati, oh, okay, I'm going backwards. I'm skipping that one. Okay, I'm nervous guys, sorry. Achkanate stok go. Achkanate stoka. Gimma be bitsin, gakoitsin, ichkanate daps ti. Achsistoit beta beatsini. Ich be bot dops. Inakot seatsin. Bumot seatsin. Nisita bat. Nisita beatsin to be blackfoot. And so these were our values that were made up our ontology, our epistemology, and our axiology. And these were our Nisita be values. Now there's many more that can be added, right? These are just ones that I like to connect with. Um, and so this was done by Rudy Blackplum. I didn't have time to put this down, but she was the one who kind of developed this. And these values are from, I believe, Red Crow Community College. So yeah, some of the elders kind of put these like core values together on here. So, <laughs> oh, sorry. oh no, that's all good. Oh yeah, yeah, I know the Gakoiksin is in the dark purple. And then Ifkanate Dapsi. Let's see. So um so let's take a new perspective to viewing trauma. Why don't we view it as trauma wisdom? So Fellner brings to light how colonial pathologizing of trauma does not honor the individual's own wisdom of trauma. So King also brings to light a diverse method in which Western culture emphasizes a reduction in individual illness and disease, whereas Nisitipi worldview concentrates on building strength and resiliency. Remember, we had the concept of trauma pre-colonization but we had things in place that helped us 
Trauma wisdom is when the individual's experience with trauma is seen as acquired knowledge from personal and collective medicine that emerges through direct, vicarious, collective, or intergenerational trauma. So one of the things, um, interestingly, when I have gone to in-services and I'm surrounded by like Napiquens, something in me is like, if something happens, how am I gonna get out of here? Where's my escape? And I kind of thought I was the only one until I heard one of my old coworkers, they said they do this in Walmart. You walk into Walmart, he's like, hey, if something happens, how am I gonna get out of here? So I'm like, oh, okay. So this is some type of like, not mine, but maybe some type of wisdom that's kind of coming through, kind of being like, okay, you be prepared. Like, you know, and you think about it, Gakoitsin, being aware of our environment. We always had to be aware of our environment, wherever we were at. We kind of had to always be like, okay, like look around, see what's around you. And I always tell my son this too, like look around. Even we're in the mountains, you look in the trees, cougars are up there. You watch out for them. You need to look around all the time. You can play, but you take the time to start looking around. And so again, just how that trauma wisdom has been passed down through our people. So could it be possible due to the nature of Nisitipi grandparents and parents possessing collective, historical, and intergenerational trauma that Nisitipi children are therefore born with complex trauma through blood memory? So identifying the individual's trauma as wisdom and honoring the coping the survivor has practiced is critical for Nisitipi people. So when learned, this coping tool will assist the individual with lifelong strategies to diminish negative mindfulness, which creates holistic resiliency and healing from a Nisitipi perspective. So again, like we talk about um, trauma as almost like incurable. And then so, you know, you have a lot of people who don't know how to feel about it. But if we can start turning that around as something like, no, you have some wisdom there, and you're gonna pass that on to you know the next generations and the next generations. Um, so I'm just going to play this. Now this is Shirley Turcott. Often I hear people say, it's a really bad suck of a deal that I get my trauma onto my, <coughs> onto my people, or onto my family, or onto wherever. You know, this, this transference of complex trauma, this transference of blood memory. Well, I want to encourage you to think about that in a little different way, to think, to think about the transference of genocidal trauma as intergenerational knowledge. This knowledge is not your enemy. Intergenerational trauma is not your enemy. It's the thing that knows what happened. It's the thing that knows what we need to do next. You know, if I didn't send some of my intergenerational trauma onto and forward to my baby, to my son, he wouldn't know at all about what actually happened. This really, what, what is, what this is that took place. We must remember, our bodies remember, our blood remembers, and we carry that forward so that you know what to do next for the next generation. If my son did not pick up my blood memory as a trauma survivor, he would not be working to try to make lives better for people, for indigenous people, every day of his life. It's my memory, my experience, that is my knowledge that moves forward into the next generation so that they know what steps are best to take next. So it's about our relationship with intergenerational <coughs> knowledge. It's about us remembering what happened in a friendly and gentle way and not reliving what happened. We don't want to relive what took place. We want to be able to remember it in a bodily way so we know what steps we want to take next. Because as you know, um, trauma takes no rest. I mean, just look at pandemic. You know, we're in. So the way she describes it there, I just, 
really like that description and how she talks about like, you know, if I didn't pass this on, he wouldn't be there pursuing social justice for our people. He wouldn't be there fighting oppression for indigenous people. Um, you know, and I think that's very, it's relatable to what we're all doing here at this conference, right? Everybody has a pursuit of social justice in some way, whether that be through education, whether that be through the environment, whether that be through um, initiatives for our people. And so Duran further presents the idea of transforming the energy trauma has and allowing the energy of trauma to become a teacher and a lesson. When she was speaking and then that last statement by Duran you know, not knowing, but I think our elders and our Indian residential school survivors did that for us, mm -hmm. sharing their stories with us so that we would never be put in a place that that would happen to us again, mm -hmm. right? And so we're learning from them. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we're, we, have, we, have, we have had to hear the stories as a means of understanding that we as the next generation, our children, never, we never want to see that happen to us again. You know? Yes, I yeah. Appreciate that, but that's what came to mind. Yeah, and just like how we're like now we're so committed. We're going to be like, no, over our dead bodies, is that we're ever going to allow that again to our people like, you know, collectively. Um, and then so I go on to recognizing the sitapi ceremony. So ceremony at Simoikan takes place naturally. So the challenge is that some individuals do not recognize when they are practicing ceremony. So this is relating to, you do not have, I, this is my opinion. This is me speaking. To practice ceremony isn't just being in a society. Every day we're practicing ceremony. When I go to light my smudge, that's the ceremony with me and my kids and my husband. When I'm braiding my son's hair, that's the ceremony that I'm doing with him. So ceremony is knowing the stories of the land, knowing those legends, that is ceremony. Ceremony is going to powwow, singing songs, speaking the language. A lot of the times we get um, people who are, they wanna be, they're conflicted, right? Because maybe they're not they feel like they're not practicing ceremony because they're not in a society. And it's like, you are practicing ceremony. Let's help you to start recognizing it. When you're saying that prayer, like, you know, I always sit back to be open. You're using the language, that direct connection. And how is that not ceremonial? Like, how can it not be? And so when you're doing that, like even picking plants and berries for food and medicine is practicing our ceremony, you're leaving that offering of tobacco. You're giving thanks to the plants. You're giving thanks to Tsakum, Mother Earth. And you know, you're thanking Creator. And so how is that not ceremony, right, for our people? And so let's start helping our people recognize, no, you are doing ceremony, right? Um, I think one of the things is people kind of get confused with religion and spirituality. And I've asked like, oh, are you spiritual? No. I don't go to church. And I'm like, well, let's look at it different. Spirituality can be anything. It could be yoga. Like it's what feeds your spirit, right? It could be yoga. Um, it could be picking berries. It could be eating food with friends and family, right? Because there's something collectively comforting when you have like comfort food with your family. Um, and so when we're doing all of this, experiential learning happens where relationship is created with the story the dance movements, the songs. It's with the words of the language and the plants. You are creating a relationship with that. And remember, everything is relational in our world. So Masadi shares that health in indigenous communities was the result of living in the community. It was participating in traditional ceremonial practices, which involved food, medicines, songs, dances, and revering the land and all her inhabitants as relatives. So you can see how pre-colonization, just by us taking part in that, that is how we were healthy. I 
I wanted to also talk about um, even at a, a Gutgatsen, there was an individual, like we talked about, again, just that um, a lot of people, again, feel like you need to be in a society to practice spirituality or to feel like you're doing ceremony. And again, this person talked about like his great grandpa used to just camp at a Gutgatsen, wasn't in any type of society. But he said, no, as Nisitapi, that's your inherent right to go up there and be with your people. You don't need to be in a society to go here. You know, and you think about when we're up there, the societies are collectively praying for the people. And so that's where everyone came. But now, you know, there's individuals who feel like they can only be up there if they're in a society. It's like, well, let's change that because that's your, your ancestors used to come up here, come and connect with them up here, right? And you think about just the goodness, you feel the goodness when you go to a, guk, a gukats and because everybody has this collective, not even prayer, but goodness there. And you feel that energy when you go there. So participating in Nisitipi practices, it was holistically healing for Nisitipi people. Again, picking berries, um, picking medicines, uh, doing things with your family in the teepee. And by practicing our Nisitipi ontology, epistemology, and axiology, we were connected collectively with the universe and with each other. So Walters also agrees that worldviews, our environment, our mind, our body, and emotional health, they're inextricably linked to human behavior. And you think about sometimes we, like I could say too, I am not fully connected sometimes. Like I have to work like everybody else to provide for my family, right? Which kind of disrupts my connection where I could be around my dad all the time learning the language fluently. But it's like, oh, I have to go work and do this. And so I'm not around that language, you know? And so for generations, Indigenous people have practiced what we now call population health, where traditional practices promoted health for all the community members by increasing collective strengths and decreasing inequities. And you think about that, everyone had a role back then, whether that be, you know, you're watching the children or you're going to get the firewood, you're taking, you know, you're cooking for everybody while someone else is, you know, making clothes, like everybody had a job to do. So when you sit to be language, so our language is a direct connection to culture and spiritual practices. So when we speak our Nisitipi language, the spiritual, the mental, the physical, the emotional domains of the individual are connected to the universe. So Little Bear describes how our language illustrate experiences and is through speaking our Nisitipi language that the individual absorbs the collective thought process of a people. So this collective thought process comprises of Nisitipi worldviews, ontologies, epistemologies, and axiologies. So Nisitipi language provides a direct connection to our ancestors. I had a language teacher, Sandra Many Feathers, and so she always talked about the language having life, which makes a lot of sense because it's verbs. It wasn't noun, so it was always in relation to. And when we're talking about in relation to, well, of course it had life, right? And so when we're speaking our Blackfoot language, it, it has life and you can feel that when you're speaking it. You know, <clears throat> when I introduce myself, like I am from, and it's like tethering myself to the land, it's tethering myself to the clan, it's tethering myself to the people, my ancestors. And so when we're using our language to introduce ourselves or you know, even just like words that you know at home, like you're still having that relational relationship with it, which is very important for our wellness. So to transfer something to others occurs when we take the time to teach our Nisitibi language. Um, I wish I knew more than I do, but I also think it's me finding the time to make that time to learn more than I want to know. Um, so our languages teaches us Nisitipi values and the Nisitipi Tsini, how to be the, well, to be Blackfoot. So root, <clears throat> she suggests changing the word attachment to connection. 
to emulate indigenous people's multiple relationships with multiple beings in the world. We had those relationships with the Soyita peaks, the Tsakumita peaks, the Spomita peaks. And when we were out in the environment, we acknowledged all of them. You know, um, one practice that I've taken up on is whenever I come to a body of water is leaving an offering for the Soyita peaks. I tell them, thank you for doing what you can for our people. I pray to you that, you know, this river is still here for my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. You know, and I think about the Tsakumita peaks, <clears throat> everything that's happening like with our animals when we're creating like when the land's going through trauma, right? You think about all of that. Um, it's giving thanks to them, like the buffalo, uh, that just everything that's on our earth. And the Spomita beaks, you know, we have a direct connection to the sky. It's in our stories. And so Nisitipi land. So reconnecting to our land is something that is essential. This includes making relationship with the plants, the rocks, the medicines, and the animals. So with the rematriation of the buffalo, they are the keystone to our people's wellness. So not only can individuals experience trauma, but the land experienced the trauma with the near extinction of the buffalo. And so now that the buffalo have returned to the land, collective wellness can begin to happen where the buffalo, land, and the people, we all begin to heal each other through a reciprocal relationship where we need the land and the land needs us. I think back to, I remember one of my old co-workers, Verda Weaselhead, she talked about how they took the children to this site. And she said when they got there, just the happiness they felt. She said the spirits that were on that land were happy to have visitors. Now, how many of these places in our territory are just waiting for someone to come and visit? And again, like, just when she talked about this, I could just feel like what she felt when she was there. And she talked about like the land was happy, the kids were there. The land was happy, the young ones were there. And she said, you could just feel it. Everybody felt it. <clears throat> and so again, like let's start to get reconnected back to that. So these are my babies there. And this is where I always take them to our timber limits. And so Reconnecting to our land is it's integral to our well-being. You know, my kids could sit by the river for hours and just throw rocks. There's something about the mountainscape that I just cannot get enough pictures of. I am just always taking pictures of the mountains. Um, you know, even in Nastico, taking pictures, I'm driving, I'm like, oh yeah, there's a good picture. I'm like, my window's down trying to drive, and <laughs> I'm like taking a picture, but it's just like, nope, I need the perfect picture. And I probably have a bunch of them, but every time I see it, I'm like, oh, that is so beautiful, right? And how much that we need to connect back to our ways for them, right? My children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. Not only that, but like even just my siblings. So let's start to do and he said to be trauma-informed practices. So Sinclair writes how Western thought and pedagogy are thought to be the standard for indigenous peoples. We know this with education, right? They have told us for many years, this is how your education has to look. And it's amazing how much changes we've been involved with, including our culture, including our language, and we're making those changes today. So Western education and practices do not represent indigenous values, languages, and ceremonial practices, and they perpetuate the suppression of indigenous worldviews. So Walters writes how traditional ways of life were ultimately traditional trauma-informed practices. You think about when we were in our clans and someone experienced trauma, collectively we felt it together. Whereas now, I'm away in my home just with my family. So it's just us. My sister's over there, my mom's over there, my brother's over there, my dad's way over there. But in our clan, we came together, we collectively carried it together. And so it wasn't so much for one person. And so in a sit to be trauma-informed practices may create environments that encourage reconnection to collective consciousness of the world. 
So Masadi et al. further supports balance with indigenous worldviews by stating, according to indigenous worldviews, the environment, mind, body, and emotional health are inextricably linked to collective human behavior, practices, wholeness, and hence wellness. And now you think about all the times that you have participated in our culture and just how your spirit feels, your body feels, how your mind feels, and how your emotions are. You know it's just collective, like it's just wellness, and that's what you're feeling. I, I guess I should find out what the Blackfoot word is for wellness. With the possibility of Nisitabik people carrying complex trauma with them since birth, it is imperative that Nisitabi worldviews be incorporated into educational and business organizations. You think about how many off-reserve businesses cater to our people, and I'm more so doing this towards Lethbridge. Um, you know, it's a very, even the surrounding towns are very racist. They're not trauma-informed for our people. They treat us as the others, right? And so it's requiring combining Nisitabi worldviews and Western ways to create something new for Nisitabi peoples. Now, for a long time, I've been in counseling. And it's been, how do we adapt that Western way of counseling to include our Nisitabi ways? And so um, you know, using talk therapy, but it's, we're smudging. We're incorporating that. And so it's not to say that we have to totally dismiss the Western ways, but let's transform them. Let's modify them to where they benefit our people. It's not that we're going to totally dismiss them because that's kind of difficult at this time, but where can we use them, modify them, transform them, and then send them out to our, like help our people start to um, get collectively well. So we will need to involve the land, of course. So again, with the rematriation of Buffalo, so now that the buffalo have returned to the land, we can think of collective wellness can begin where the buffalo, the land, and the people all begin to heal each other through reciprocal relationship. And I've heard a lot of talk about like with the buffalo coming and even the ladies yesterday, I really enjoyed their talk um, just with what they're doing here in Bigani. And I had a note on there. Uh, just even their stories about like how even their, uh, what are they? Their cows started acting like the buffalo, right? Started mimicking and she said her, the calves were jumping like the buffalo calves and just like how she's like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, you're mixing together. I'm not separating you anymore, right? And so just even like the wellness there and she talked about like what's happening um, the buffalo went to the water and then she talked about like how downstream the beavers started coming back upstream and started building a dam there. And like she kind of talked about like a chemical thing and I was like, maybe it's spiritual, like a connection, right? Like how we say we're all connected. And so I found that really interesting, her story for that. So by reinforcing the Sittabis people connect, people's connection with culture, language, ways of healing, Cultural identity can be strengthened. And when we say cultural identity, it's being proud of who you are, knowing where you come from, but then also like tethering yourself to the land, tethering yourself to your ancestors. It's tethering yourself to your family, to your clan. So one way we can do this is to encourage individuals to build relationship with our Nisitipi values, our ceremony, natural laws, customs, and tradition. So creating this foundation can help our people heal from trauma. And I've heard, I've heard this said like many times throughout this conference. And so I'm like, okay, like this is the change makers. It's starting like, you know, everything's beginning to come together for our people. So Little Bear explains that teaching the Nisitipi culture and values is done through experience of the extended family and is a collective responsibility. So it is our responsibility to start to show, be that example of wellness, to start to show others about wellness. If someone comes to you, it's like, oh, okay, let's figure this out together. Maybe we can connect you with an elder. Maybe we can 
just go to a gukatsin for the day. We'll just go watch the dancing, right? And so we need to be advocates and guides for others so that healing can begin in our communities. And so I ask that we empower yourselves and empower each other. Now, I don't know where I got this quote, and I'm kind of upset that I didn't write down who said it. But they say, no matter what happened in the past, no matter what you've been going through lately, no matter what diagnosis you've been given, how stuck you feel, how much trauma you've experienced, remember, you have the innate ability to heal. And you are surrounded by helpers, guides, and ancestors who support your greatest good. Even if you feel alone right now, trust that they are there for you. They are here for you as you rise and step onto your sacred path. And so I just want to kind of conclude with um, the theme of this conference. Culture is medicine. Our language is medicine. Our, like, nisita bitsini is medicine, right? Our land is medicine. And so we, and I really liked the, the Ira provost that we were just in, he talked about relational accountability and just talked about how he has that relational accountability to his ancestors. And so I think about like what our ancestors have experienced for us. Well, let's start helping others be relational and accountable for everybody, right? Um, and so these are my references. So thank you. There's my contact email. Does anybody have any questions, comments, feedback? I accept feedback. Yes. I do. Oh. Okay. You know, um, I've gone to several of these these courses. They're wonderful. You're wonderful. You're a wonderful speaker. Um, and but what strikes me is that um, trauma is a negative word. I went to the. Uh, uh, James Welch won yesterday. Excellent book. Read it. I think Cameron and I were yeah, in the same class. Yeah. The same class. <laughs> anyway, um, and all I could think, he said, well, what, what brought to mind, you know, it's one of the best books ever on uh, the TTP, but um, it's tragic. Why is Indian life so tragic? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because I told her, well, trauma. Well, that means we have positive trauma. Yeah. 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 We have positive trauma that we know how to do this. Yeah. We know how to do that. But all of these things are about negative trauma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. let's celebrate the positive yeah, trauma let's, that let's has been passed celebrate on. Celebrate the joy, you know, yes. the comfort, the relief. Let's celebrate, yes. you know, our health. Mm -hmm. Why is it always so negative? Yeah. You know. Trauma, when you talk about trauma, traumatic, you know, I was a, I, I came from the boarding school, went over there, and it's like, when do we put that away and look forward? Mm. When do we put it away? I, I'm a boarding school, I mm -hmm. went to boarding school, I was six years in boarding school here in the States, but when do we put that away? When does it stop? When do we change that? that fatalism, you know, we can't forget it because it happened. But the point is, is where do we go from there? When do we change the word trauma mm -hmm. to joy, to comfort, mm -hmm. you know, to all of these other words? When do we do that? So do we stop using trauma and instead use challenges? That could that be. Kind of more of a yeah, that might be something, you know. Always yeah. it. Yeah. I'm Camille and I'm traumatized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, there's all these negative connotations, you know. Yeah. Were, were you a victim of domestic violence? Or are you an addict? Or something, you know. You're, you're not, most likely. But if you yeah. say, I'm Indian and I'm traumatized. Yeah. All of a sudden, all of these negative connotations, and then they start seeing you in that light. Mm-hmm. You know. And when do we change that? Yeah. I guess that, that would be up to you. Oh, that's <laughs> up to you. You can change that today. Yeah, you can change that today for yourself, right? Yeah. 
Like, I'm not going to say, oh, you need to change that today. It's for you, like your journey, and I'm not you. So and I don't, right? And since you're teaching it, yeah. then start changing as collective. Yeah. But, you know, one of the most uh, traumatized people are veterans. Mm -hmm. My son is a uh, veteran from the Afghanistan and uh, Iraqi wars. Mm -hmm. And those people come home and they come home and they, first thing they do is they start self-medicating. Mm -hmm. And, but the thing is, is we have a ceremony for that. Mm -hmm. To bring them home, mm -hmm. just like you had said. Mm -hmm. Bring all those pieces and all that loss mm -hmm. endured over there in a foreign land, in a foreign country. We have that. Mm -hmm. Now, why aren't we using that mm -hmm. to heal ourselves instead of just continuing to re, I guess, reenact the residential days or the boarding school days? Mm -hmm. You know, why don't we look at it? Yes, we survived so that you and your generation did not have to go through that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's just me, but it seems like Indian life is so tragic. Mm -hmm. But my life has been really good. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really good. I, I mean, I, I have a loving husband. I have raised three good men. You know, I have these wonderful grandchildren. Yeah. I live in a nice house. You know? Yeah. Those type of things. Yeah. And, uh, those might be superficial, but the point is, and I pray every day. Yeah. I smudge every day. Mm -hmm. So spiritually, I am comforted. I am calm. I, I, mm -hmm. I enjoy life. I enjoy waking up in the morning. Why don't we say that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So when are we going to put this away? Yeah. And, and start focusing our energies on enjoyment of our lives as Indian people, as Native Americans as it seems to be, mm -hmm. you know, I, I guess that's me, but it just seems always so darn tragic. Yeah. Like a Greek tragedy. You know? <laughs> and you think about back then also, there was hardships. There was. You know, there was times where there was starvation among clans. There was times where there was sickness among clans. And so again, it's like that balance. There's bad and good. But a lot of the times we've been taught to focus on the bad. We don't look at the good that's happened along with the bad, right? Like you think of, like I used to tell, when I had my girls group at elementary, I used to tell them, okay, this is the difference. Oh, my kids were late. They wouldn't wake up. I had to go and start rushing around and get them ready. And then on my way to work, I went and got a flat tire. And then I was late. My boss called me in to the office and said, why are you late? I had to explain all this. And then I said, oh, now this is the difference. My kids were tired. I let them sleep a couple minutes. I was late. That was OK. I got to see the sunrise because usually when I go through work, it's still dark. I got a flat tire, but that's okay. I saw Awagasi down the road. I might have bumped one. And then I got to work, my boss called me in and we chatted and we got to talk and I got to tell her, oh, this is kind of a crazy morning. So you can see that difference, right? How I explained it in different ways. And so a lot of the time we're stuck in this Kind of negative, I guess. I don't know. Whereas we are like, oh, creator was watching me. Yeah, my kids needed to sleep, right? And so I do understand like with those uh, Western ways, it's almost like, yeah, like you said, Indian life is tragic <laughs> when it's not, right? We are all examples of it not being tragedy. You know, we're thriving. We're all coming together at um, organize, like events like this. And we're all spinning ideas off of each other. We're all talking about like, oh, this is what we're going to do with our research. This is what we're going to do for our people, for our communities, our nations. It's talking about collaborations over that medicine line, right? And so it's not all tragic. And so I do agree with you, though. It is a lot of that, like pathologizing, incurable. 
Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and that's that was that's always been my contention. And then you get, you know, people uh, like James Welch, and they have the best book in the world and everything, but it's tragic. And then so everybody sees Indian life as tragic. Then we start seeing Indian life as tragic, and uh, then, yeah, uh, and then. We all become dementors. Harry Potter, yeah. right? Suddenly, yeah. suck the life out of the air. Yeah. You know? <laughs> dementors. I love that Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. 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 You start internalizing that oppression, right? Internalizing that racism, and that was my comment here. It just seems. Let's let's make a new paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. No. Let's start the new paradigm right here. Yeah. And that, that's kind of what that Shirley Turcott does, that psychologist. And so she's using, okay, well, if you experience trauma, then use it to grow from, to, okay, that's not going to happen to me again. I'm going to prevent this, you know? Mm -hmm. And so don't use trauma with, like, oh, me. And then oh, me. Use it as you know, something to grow from and be stronger. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's us that are survivors from the boarding school times, mm -hmm. or residential school times, is that we survive. Mm -hmm. And survival means resilience, and survival mm -hmm. means we built our lives, rebuilt our lives. Mm -hmm. Even though we, we shouldn't forget, the point is we have to step out of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how I feel about it. No. I'm not a sociologist or anything like you guys, but I'm well, a you have that knowledge, you know, and Thank that's you. the thing too is like the uh, differentiation with knowledge, right? Like the like your knowledge is just as important as what I presented on. You know what I mean? And so it's like that. There's no, we're all equal, right? And. That's the way I see, like what your knowledge you shared. Oh, great. What are you presenting on next year, right? Like <laughs> that could be your presentation next year, right? Well, I've, like, I've got a few initiatives that I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to move earth, earth and sky. Yeah. And so like it does, I don't think it matters like what kind of, um, how could I say, titles that you have with your name. You have the experience and for our people, that's, that is, you know, such great, yeah, that is as equal. Like we talk about our imminent scholars, our elders and the life experiences and what they've survived. And we call them imminent scholars, you know, and somehow I feel like even your knowledge is just as equal as what I have, you know, and what I've gone to school with. You think about the times when we've, very been passionate and we want to advocate, you know, for ourselves, for our people, when we want to advocate and say, no, like when we're, and I always feel like our people never stop contributing to the greater good of our nations and our tribe. Even we had like probably how they're saying elders over a hundred years old, they were still contributing. And that was the thing you heard from everybody because everybody's voice was important because you never knew, like again, like what, this is what Tamara had said, you never knew what dream came to that person, right? For our nation. And so I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's just my, me, but that would be, like I can't answer that for you, it'd be for you, right? When, yeah. like you're yeah. writing the yeah, books. Well, I guess the, the question came up because uh, the point is, is that, you know, we, we had all these el older men, let's see, that were the leaders of our, um, Scott B. and uh, and then they stayed too long, hmm. and then so my generation was skipped over. And now we have a new, a very young hmm. council. Mm -hmm. So, and and I kept thinking, when do we step aside to let you or your generation become the warriors? that line, hold that line for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that, that being too philosophical here. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody should have their time, you know, and mm -hmm. you have women warriors too. Yeah. To yourself. Yeah. Standing that oh, line. Thanks. Holding that line. Um, so and 
that's what I do. In the uh, state government, or else we have to stand on that wall, make sure that the tribes of Montana are uh, represented and the tribes of Montana are protected mm -hmm. from policy, from legislation that would terminate us. And so we always have to stand on that wall, but there's a point in time when you stop doing that mm -hmm. and let the let the younger generation take that position. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our people have gotten stuck in the story, but it could be he's telling that story for all the children, like all the people who didn't tell their story of somebody. So it's collectively he's telling it for everybody, like not just his experience, but something in him is like, oh yeah, no, I'm telling it for that person, that person. But he doesn't know why, right? Because we talk about, like I think of a spider web and how we're just like all connected. And sometimes when you pull on one part of the string, it kind of gets tightened, right? And so that could be, like that's what I'm wondering, is that something he's like, how you're saying, he's like, I don't know why I keep saying this. Well, maybe he's telling it for somebody else who didn't get the opportunity to say it. But then I get you, how do we move him through that to be like, you know, and I guess I've heard genocide informed practices instead of trauma informed, right? And I think one of the things is, I don't want to say, like I have to figure out the word to say, but I don't wanna be like normalizing trauma because that's not what we wanna do, but to help the children realize, oh, again, like you're not alone, right? That's like, thanks for sharing. You're not alone in what happened, but let's figure out what we can do now with that story, right? And I feel like sometimes our people just, like we do, I could get stuck in a story. I've been stuck in a story with my neighbors putting, <laughs> planting their stuff on my lot there. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? Like I've been stuck in that story and I'm like, hey, I need to move out of this. But it's also helping them realize that there is a way to move out. Because sometimes our people, they only know what they know. And so it's like, how do we start to help them realize, oh, okay, there's this option, there's this, there's this, right? We can start to figure out how we can, and everyone's different. What works for me won't work for that person, but it's like helping them realize what is their um, medicine for wellness, right? We talk about, um, like I talk about <laughs> laughing and I'm like, oh yeah, I needed that medicine and then I go away, right? You know, and just thinking of those little bits of medicine that we have in our life and helping people start to realize, okay, what kind of medicine do you need right now? And there's a thing called um, Indigenous Focus Oriented Therapy. And it's quite interesting. And Shirley Turcott's just on YouTube and you guys can look her up. But she talks about how trauma is bodily stored. And so she talks about with some people in here, and it's very fascinating because it'll be like, oh, you know what happened? And she does not worry about the story. She's worried about where it is in your body. Where do you feel that? Oh, I feel it in my chest. What's it feel like? Well, it feels like this. So again, it's like, how do we start utilizing some of those things for our people and taking them for us, right? To help us, those people not to be stuck in that loop of story, you know, the story 10, 20 times, but how do we get them to be like, ha oh, I'm kind of, that's behind me, so. Well, thanks, because I have lots of uh, questions I could ask my elder about. Yeah, you know, one of the things she's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of the things um, she talks about brushing off. And so when my son comes home from Bogosan, there's been a couple of times he's just like, ah, and I'm like, okay, kid, let's brush you off. And so I grab like a Kleenex and I just start, okay, get that. And then I brush his back, I brush his face and his head, and I said, let's throw our Kleenex away, you know? And then it's like, he's just like, oh. And I don't, I wish I had a Kleenex, box of Kleenex, because I'd have you guys all do it. There's something about it, because it's like, you think of tissue, it's made from wood. And so we're using land as a kind of like a cleansing. Oh, okay. And so there's been times too, like I've had him transform. He went to the dentist. 
that he was like, um, kind of he absorbed yeah. yeah or he absorbed it from someone else like we're all relational and you think about somebody when they come into a room and you can feel like you're like oh this person <laughs> Like, you know, and you, we're, we're all relational and we felt that. Um, and so he was going to the dentist. Okay, be brave. What do you need to be brave like? A cougar. Okay, great. You be brave like a cougar. And so talking, like having him like that, he transformed himself to be able. So like, how do we get our people back into that? Like we had transformers back then, right? You talk about people shape-shifting. And so I've told my son, he had to go back again. Okay, you got to be brave again, baby. Are you going to be a cougar again? What are you going to be? No, a wolf. Okay, let's be a wolf when we go into that dentist chair. And so he was a wolf this time, right? But it's helping him navigate that, like, oh, you can transform in certain times, right? Um, Yeah, so that's what I really like about Indigenous Focus-Oriented Therapy. And so there's things like that. Did he bite the dentist? (laughs) You know what? He was okay. He was brave. There was no bad. He got the needle, got a filling. I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes. And sorry, you had a question? Um, I seen this one lady uh, like a few years ago, and I was really going through a hard time in my life. Mm-hmm. And she came and she, she um, uh, came and worked on her energy with me. She told me, you know, there's, there's like different kinds of people where they, like she said, I could tell you, you just like kind of know. Like when I came in here, you were telling me, you're like, you know, you just know, like people can see the whole big picture, whereas others, they kind of, um, uh, like, com- com- uh, compartmentalize. Yeah, yes, that's the word. <laughs> yeah, like different things and everything. So it takes them, like, they have a different perspective of everything. Yeah. And uh, she's also said that, like, when you're, when you're having too much, um, you know, you're holding on to things that you're not supposed to hold on to. Like she said, you you can imagine it, say it, like the connection that I'm having between you two. She said, you can imagine that connection any way you want me. I do it like a rainbow kind of like that. Mm-hmm. And when so, somebody's giving me negative energy and I don't want to take that with me, um, then like you just have to cut it off. Mm-hmm. And that's how you protect your energy space. Mm-hmm. And then she said, also, if you really can't, if, if, like, if you're holding on to that negative stuff even more, you go out and you, you pray and then you, you give it back to the one. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. You, feel, you give it back to Creator because we all have like energy channels to create. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, I completely agree with that because you think of, too, like when we talk about blood memory and say I'm feeling something, well, that's probably not even mine. That could have been my grandma's. But through blood memory, I'm feeling it right now, right? So, and it's like, yeah, give it back to the land. Okay, thank you. You did, you taught us what you needed to teach me, my grandma, my dad. Here, again, we're done with it. And then it's like, oh, you know, and I think like what you're saying, like talking, teaching young ones, well, why not give them the power to name their own, to name trauma? What would you call it, you know? Start making our little ones have that empowerment. Oh, yeah, this is what that is to me, right? Like to start giving them that power because like someone, like our people, even our little kids, they're so intuitive. They're so smart. Let's start giving them that power. Okay, this is what we can call it. Do you have another name for it? Yeah, like, you know, you might get, I want to call it this. Someone else wants to call it that. Someone else wants to call it that. But like, let's start giving our young people, our kids, that empowerment to name what they think it should be named, right? I think as adults, we often project onto young people our, um, our definitions of words. An example is, I did a grief and law, I didn't do, I was uh, facilitating a grief and loss for young people and uh, in high school, and grief and loss to me is on death and dying. Mm-hmm. Right? And, I sat there and there was two facilita- facilitators in the room that came in from other organizations and they were talking to the students about grief and loss and their grief and loss was like not one of them mentioned death, not one of them. Yep. Their grief and loss was about even like moving out of a house that they had been living in. Mm-hmm. Grief and loss was about um, losing a pet. 
grief and loss was about you know older siblings yep. that had you know had, had married. Yes. Grief and loss to them looked so different, and I was just blown away that um, because us as adults that had planned the event were all on death and dying. Yeah. And they're just like that was the furthest thing from their mind. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, again, it was. Um, um, I laughed at one of the boys. He was like, Gene, my brother got married. He's my best friend. And I'm just like a third wheel. And he was like so upset, you know, when he, he was like upset. He was visibly shaking. That yeah. That happened, David. Um, but that's one story that I just wanted to share. You know, when we talk about, you were talking about how, how do you take stuff away from you and then, you know, giving it back to the land. For us, I just laughed when I, my image in my head was, it's so windy in all of our areas. Yes. And I'm like, I always would drive away from certain places and roll all my stuff. I'd say it out loud as I'm driving from work and put it in a bar, open my window, and I'd say <gasps> it out, and I just laugh, Wow. I, thought, I laughed. I said, if all those people in Saskatchewan and Northern Dakota <laughs> must all have all the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like I think that's really good. Like, yeah, and that's one of the things too. It's like intentionally putting it into the land because it could be, well, I'll come in the room and then I'm like, what the heck is going? Like all of a sudden I have that and I'm like, why am I feeling like this? Right? Like I've absorbed it unintentionally, right? And so it's like us intentionally, okay, like setting it down, like talking down or you know and you think about like um and this is really interesting our elders when they talk they go mm. Mm. they're setting it down for us when they're listening to you they're mm. or they just listen and they just look down mm. right they're they we've known this they're taking it oh and they're setting it down for you and i thought like oh my gosh yes that's a exactly what I've experienced with all my elders when we're talking, right? They do that and how it's intuitive, it's innate, right? Just that connection that we have and just how much we practice it without knowing that we're doing it type of thing. So yeah, any more comments? Great discussion, guys. <laughs> I really well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you all.